and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. A long, a long time, a long time venerable, fi venerable face in the, in the world of tabletop. Some, of, some of you may know him as the man behind Vampire, lit, and some, and some more of you will soon, know, will soon know him as the, as the man behind the, behind the dark fantasy appro approach in the Curse of Bloodstone Isle. Make sure to bring your shanties. The one and only Mark Reinhagen. How are you doing today, man? Great, great. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, nice to be in the temple. Thank you, thank you for thank you for coming up. I know that um, a temple all the way up in the mountains is is certainly a far is certainly a far cry from a from a pirate infested island. <laughs> it is. It is indeed. Oh. Uh, of course, Bloodstone Island is just the beginning. It's actually the Lost Lauren project. Mm -hmm. So we're doing a whole dark fantasy world. So what I did with World of Darkness. Set in the modern world, I'm doing kind of from the, but the monster's point of view. Mm -hmm. I'm doing again in a fantasy world, so it's a dark fantasy world where we have a series of games from the monster's point of view. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it lets you sort of uh, play, uh, you know, um, you know, basically if you want a d20 type game, but it's really d20 mixed with uh, storyteller. Mm -hmm. There's dots, and uh, you can, um, you know. This is the beginning of a, of, a, of an entire project. Is all I wanted to say. Yeah. So, with the with that in mind, I'd like to open at the humble beginnings. Now, you've been you've been involved in in gaming in one form or another for a long time, but I'd like you to walk me through um, the er, the early the early days of it. What got what got you into this weird and wonderful hobby of ours? Uh, my dad's a minister, and uh, one day his intern pastor, who was training, uh, preached at my dad's church, giving my dad a, a day off. And after church, the intern came over and had uh, Sunday lunch with us, which is the, our big meal of the week, you know. Mm -hmm. And after lunch, he says, hey, there's this new game out, and I just got this new book, The Player's Handbook, which had literally just come out, I guess, that week or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, do you want to play? And I was like, yes. I was so excited. So my dad and I, he played a dwarf. I played an elf. We played beneath, uh, Beyond the Unknown Dungeon, which is one of the first dungeons to come out. And uh, it was fantastic. Uh, my dad got trapped in some spider webs. And I was able to free him. And I was hooked. And I started going to this poor guy's house all the time after school, asking him questions, asking him to run, and I was just totally into it. And then I um, eventually, through a program called Youth in Government, which is where you, uh, uh, it's a Minnesota thing where you get to actually take over the legislature, the actual legislature, and run a mock uh, state government. Um, I met some kids who also played D and D, and that was my first sort of gaming group. And uh, I played D and D for a couple years, and then I discovered Call of Cthulhu, and my group, and I realized that it was really more about storytelling and characters and role playing. And my group was pretty murder hobo, and so they uh, kicked me out of the group. So I actually lost. Uh, pretty much all my friends in one blow and was alone. But I still had my books. And so I started writing articles for different companies and, and began that process of joining the industry as a teenager. And then I went, I moved to Australia and sort of gave up gaming for surfing. And But then once again, some of the cool kids turned out to be d and Ders. I started running, uh, um, you know, some... Chaosium games for them, and uh, we suddenly were. I was back into gaming, and then went to college, and I met Jonathan Tweet of uh, Third Edition D and D fame, mm -hmm. and he and I decided to write our first role playing game, Ars Magica, when I was like nineteen, and he was twenty, I think. And so, yeah, I started 
you know, started pretty young. And with that, with that, in, with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, now obvious, obviously, um, a couple, a couple of the major, a couple of the major credits that you, that are to, that are to your name is the is the creation of um, Vampire and the <laughs> the ins the complete and total insanity that is Mage. Um, okay, I love Mage, but but it but facts are the facts, and I am comp I as part of my vows, I am compelled to tell the truth. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You meant um, you mentioned er you mentioned earlier um, that the lost that. The Lost Lorne project was was another case of storytelling from the monster's perspective. Was that how was that how the concept of vampire and the and the world of darkness um, came came about of just wanting to do storytelling from well the well I, I, the the real genesis of it was that uh, one summer during college Jonathan stayed at my house and my sister and I and Jonathan went to see Lost Boys. At the movie theater, and we absolutely loved that movie. It was a perfect summer movie, and it was just so thrilling. And as we left the movie theater, Jonathan said, "Wow, it would be so cool to have a role playing game about vampires, but it would be so boring to always fight the vampires." And I looked at him and I said, "I bet there's a really good way to do it. I don't know it right now, but I'll come up with something." And then years later, on the way to Gen Con, after, you know, uh, after a couple years of poverty and hardship and eating Dale donuts and ramen noodles, total poverty, uh, and looking for a new game and not be able to find it, I had to try to do uh, a game called Inferno, where you play someone in hell. Mm -hmm. And literally, the pizza driver crashed his car into the electrical transformer in front of our house as he left the brake off. The car rolled down the hill. It blew up all our computers, all of our phones, all of electronics, our fax machine, which back then was actually an important machine. Mm -hmm. And we were out of business. And so it, it's sort of that's where the Wraith curse began, by the way. Um, and so I was just desperately looking for it. And I was looking at the window and I was remembering that conversation. And I was looking at Gary, Indiana. And it suddenly hit me oh, you are the vampire. And I started writing it in my notebook. And that Gen Con, I didn't go to any parties, uh, hardly. Or if I did, I had my notebook with me. Um, I hardly went to the booth. I didn't do anything. I just would ask people to run and get me more notebooks. I like, fill up so many notebooks. And it just kind of came out of me. It's like I've been preparing my whole life to write Vampire. Mm -hmm. Like all my love of mafia movies, all my love of you know those 80s vampire movies, you know, all my, uh, you know, pop culture sensibilities, my curiosity about goth culture, all of it just came together. And I, I it just like, it was one of those amazing moments. Like I was in the flow mm -hmm. and for about that lasted for about nine months. And that's how long it took to write the game. Yeah. And it's in, it as a bit of an aside, it's in, it's interesting that you bring up Lost Boys since some, um... Joel, Schu Joel Schumacher's legacy, legacy as a director has is um a, is a little bit under underrated in my opinion because unfortunately, absolutely because he's gay yeah unfortunately every, unfortunately everybody everybody always brings up the Batman movies that he was associated with which um I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to sit here and defend those movies but I will say yeah. that I think they're a bit overhated um. Yeah, yeah, but but you know, I mean, they back then they didn't really understand how to do a superhero movie. They were still trying to figure it out. I mean, they hadn't; no one had done it right, right you know. I'd say, um, um, and so they didn't really know what they were doing. I'd say, I'd say around that time, the the big issue was um, was Warner getting in their own way, because because here's here's the story as I understood it: Batman Returns did not do as well as the original. Meaning that the Warners were only able to buy two yachts instead of one, or so, sorry, one yacht instead of yeah. instead of two yacht. Because um, <laughs> I think I think it was the fourth highest grossing movie that year, which which is still good is still good, but I guess not good enough. And then there was the um, 
Then there were the parents groups who didn't who didn't like how more how more um Burton ish it was. So they wanted something more family friendly, but at the same time they wanted something as dark as the original because of how successful that was. And you can kind of see the problem here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it definitely it was an issue. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, they, well, they did get back then, I think, which is part of the formula of superhero movies now, is the uh, the humor. You know, they didn't understand that they had to be a little bit campy and basically be a comedy of sorts. I think, and 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 they 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 were playing too much into the he's a dark knight, you know, and of course the dark knight I think you know played against that type, but all the Marvel movies are basically they're comedies, right? They're they're action comedies, so. And I think I was, they didn't realize that that's what would sell back then. Even with something as dark as um as the as the Blade movies, there's there's some there's some de- there's some degree of 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 dark humor, whether it be um the many many deaths and mutilations of of Quinn who keeps getting his ass kicked, or that or in the second movie that one um that one guy who kept who kept who kept getting in harm's way who. Who apparently is a um is a big is a big deal in Spain in t- in terms of the Spanish comedy scene, so it was a bit it was a bit of a in jo- it was a bit of an in joke on um on Del Toro's part, but uh, okay there there's a there's a reason the phrase comic relief is um utilized, and I think I think that's something that a l- that a lot of people don't um I w- I'd say I'd say on some level disunderstand like they understand they they have the complete wrong understand wrong understanding of what comic relief is where they think it's the annoying side character that's what happens yeah yeah relief. no no that, that's that's not that's that's not right at all yeah mm-hmm. and I, it's interesting about comedy is that i think comedy is a huge part of role playing but you it's you can't write comedy in a book very well right i mean uh confederacy of dunces is a funny funny book written in a book, but normally it's very, very hard to put comedy in a book. And to tell people how to do comedy in a game is really, really hard. Yet comedy is a key part of any gaming table, as any role player can tell you. I think it's telling. So with that vampire, I had to kind of find a way to make it, hey, it's okay to have to still have fun and be comedy, you know, um, without actually saying, have fun and take things lightly, because you don't want to kill the vampire vibe either. So, you know, that, that's why I introduced clans like the Malkavians and, and some sort of, you know, more wild things that were, you know, just so that make it clear, hey, you know, this is about having fun too, you know? And, and uh, you know, this is a weird and bizarre world. And, and I think weird and bizarre naturally lends itself to comedy. So, yeah. Um, that's sort of how I did it. Um, now, th- now, the other the other major one that I, that I brought up that I brought up early on was um was was mage and was there a, was there a similar origin story when it when it came to mage of just that fla- just that flash of inspiration or what or did was the route a little bit different well I mean uh Stuart uh that's the one game in the world of darkness in the, of the original games that Stuart did um um, he asked to do it. I was a bit reluctant, but you know he was my partner, so I let him. And my original brief was, "Hey, let's do Ars Magica in the present day, but with a very modern twist." Mm-hmm. And and he sort of took it further than that, uh, which is fine. Um, and so when we were developing it, you know, it really became this, uh, you know, almost like a, a game about philosophy. You know, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I think a lot of people love Mage because it's almost like a role-playing game where you're role-playing a philosophy seminar, you know, and that you're ar- when you're doing magic, you're arguing philosophical systems and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so people who like that, this is like their favorite game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's what you want to, that's what, you know, that's what I want to do with the World of Darkness is do all these different games for different types of players. Mm-hmm. So people who just want to be wild and crazy can play uh, Werewolf and people who want to be, uh, you know, you know, trippy and uh, out of this world can play Changeling and people who want hard, hard, hardcore goth, hardcore horror can play Wraith and, mm-hmm. you know. 
And that's the same thing we're doing in, in, in uh, of course, I'm, I'm doing the same thing in Lost Lorne, you know, like Fang Night is about the, you know, vampires with a creepier vibe because they have a sort of a spider thing going on. Then we have the Bane Night, which is the werewolves, which is really out there and crazy. But but it's flipped because the, our werewolves are, um, are uh, the ones who have the masquerade and the vampires are living out in the open. So, and then we go through, and so we're doing all these different games that appeal to different audiences. But unlike World of Darkness, you know, like you couldn't really play a mage character with a vampire with a werewolf, right? Because we that was never part of the conception is to play them together. And, um, and frankly, it was just too hard to figure out how to make them balance after the fact. They didn't balance, right? But, uh, but in this time, we have enough lead time, years of F work working on the system, that, that the characters will all be balanced. And so you can actually play them together in the same campaign where you can play a mixed party, you know? Yeah. And with, but now with that, with that in mind, since the, since the, since um, Bloodstone Isle is, is basically the launching point for the, for the Lost Lorne project, I do it. I do have to ask the obvious question. Vampires, and pirates, what gave you what gave you the idea to to have to have those two have those two um, components well, as the well, they're my two favorite subgenres? <laughs> what, do you have so a, do you have a like, you know, in the back or something? I I, I uh, have a friend with an accordion who plays sea shanties at the bar we hang out at, <laughs> and he's actually my co-writer in the novel we're doing set on Bloodstone. So you know. So yeah, we have a pretty deep fascination with uh, with pirates and and that culture. And uh, you know, I've, I've spent my whole life studying pirate culture, and I've always wanted to do a pirate game. Uh, but then Seven Seas came out, and that was kind of oops, that's gone. So, but anyway, um, uh, Bloodstone Island is just sort of like, hey, if you could, what was the, what would be the best way to combine vampires and pirates? Mm -hmm. And make it so that it's not only a portal into Lost Lauren, but, but people could use it as a fantasy set, uh, you know, campaign setting for any fantasy game. And sort of give your players uh, this amazing sandbox. Um, and the key selling point is, is that, you know, in the same way that all my games tend to have the initial chapters be written from the monster's point of view mm -hmm. so they they suck you into the world and you're you know you're talked to as your character not as a player so we have two different books one book is for the player and that is actually written by a guy named Adsquill, who's this um scholar sent to the island to map things and write a report mm -hmm. and that is actually given to the players this is amazing treasure here here's a book that you, your characters are given this book and the players can read that and then they, that's their guide to the island. So the game master doesn't have to explain everything, doesn't have to have these long monologues. Like the players can take turns reading this book, and then they can choose where they want to go on the island. They choose their own, own adventure. This book is their guide. Mm -hmm. And I just love that style of play. Ever since I played in a, a Gen Con Call Cthulhu game run by Chaosium where they just threw a wallet on the table and said, you find this. And inside the wallet was like, you know, business cards and ID and money and notes and a key and all these different things. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the session, we actually get to use the key to open up a, a lockbox mm -hmm. and find out that what, what, this lockbox was sitting on the table the whole time. But, but we didn't know the, 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 the other code, the other lock. We could finally we could unlock it. It was just a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. I just love that, that you know. Um, letting players guide themselves and uh, having players have a puzzle they can figure out and uh, taking some of the load off the game master from having to, you know, not, no, no game. I don't think, I don't think any of us game masters want to lead our players by the nose. We, we recognize that's not a, a great way to do things. You have to do a good story. Sometimes you got to kind of do that. Mm. And uh, this is, this is written and designed so you don't have to force your players to do anything. They'll, it's designed to let players figure everything out on their own. Yeah. Now, one per one particular avenue that um, 
became a bit of a hallmark throughout the throughout the World of Darkness line, and I'm get and I'm guessing is still is still going to be a factor here, is um factions, like back back then back then there was. And I back and I don't mean just say clans and vampire, but just fa but just factions in terms of over overall directions. Um, I'd say the I'd say the big the big example when it came to vampire is those who is the division of those who are willing to follow the rules of the masquerade and those who are are more willing to flaunt against it. Um, but it but within Bloodstone Owlers, there's is there going to be some degree of um. Of, of oh, absolutely! Game. That's the, that's my favorite trick, <laughs> right? Uh, that trick never fails. Uh, I always use it, and it's because I I see the world through a political lens. I'm a political consultant, um, as a sort of like my you know real job, and I, I travel the world and go to different countries to, to do political consulting. And the way political uh, politicos see the world is that you know um, you want to put together a coalition. Um, to, to for your candidate or your party, and, and that coalition is made up of different factions. So maybe there's you know soccer moms is the one you hear a lot about in America. It's one of the older older ones. Um, you know you have uh, stay at home dads. Uh, you can mix that with you know the gun lobby. Um, you know the anti abortion people or whatever, or the you know the pro uh, the pro life people or or the or the pro abortion people, whatever you want. There's all these different factions. And everyone fits into one or more of these factions, but but you sort of see the world as these factions, and you want to put them together. And 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 factions tend to be, you know, even though people aren't diametrically opposed to each other, you know, you can be friends with your neighbor who has different opinions. These factions are, and that's where the conflict of society almost always comes from. If you look at reading history, the the, fa the conflict always comes from these different factions, you know. Um, like in Rome, before Caesar took power, there was the older factions who wanted to keep the power because they're the landowners. And there's the new, uh, the plebeian factions who were the lower classes who wanted to get some of the power. And there was a big civil war going on, similar to what's happening in America right now, mm -hmm. uh, between the reformers and the more you know traditionalists. And it ended with Caesar seizing power as a dictator, you know, mm -hmm. and that was the end of Roman democracy. And so. Uh, yeah, so anyway, um, I, I think it's just a really easy way. You know, Coterie Charts, um, which I invented for Vampire, and it's in all the different World of Darkness games. Just to, it sort of shows the power dynamics of the situation. Mm -hmm. And we have a Coterie Chart, of course, for <laughs> that I wrote for, for this. And I just think it just is a great way to sort of show players and the Game Master how things are working and then how things can be manipulated. Because that's really what, you know, that's a lot of fun. You know, the, people love LARP because you can do this intrigue stuff. And to have intrigue work, you got to kind of know who hates who, who likes who, who can kind of get along with who, and then how you can manipulate that. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a big part of intrigue, right? Oh, yeah. You know? And, and so so that's that's why I do things in factions. So, And that's why I explain factions with Coterie charts. Yeah. And it's... Given given the fact that one of my given the fact that one of my go to games for years was Legend of the Five Rings, I've um I've inundated myself quite a bit when it comes to faction play since that's since that's one of the big th big things with the clans in that in that project. Um, yeah, yeah, now, which they borrow from me, but that's that's fine. <laughs> um, I um, I haven't haven't you ever heard the I expression? borrowed it as well. Haven't you ever heard the expression "If you rip from one guy, it's plagiarism; if you rip from a dozen guys, it's research"? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I prefer the one, the line that you know, "Don't borrow, steal." Mm -hmm. Like just, just you know, just use it and abuse it. You know, ideas are for free; you can't protect ideas. Yeah, and they should, and you should want to. Well. Oh. The one, the last time, the last time somebody tried to protect, tried to protect an idea, tried to protect an idea like that, it was, um, it was, it was the, it was the guy who kept suing everybody for, for, um, for using the word et, for using the word edge, and then, and then he ended up picking a fight with a bigger fish, and the, and the story writes itself. Yeah, um, yeah, what a dummy. But, 
with the, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, because of the fact that this is using um, a f that this is going to be um, 5e compatible, um, that bring that brings me to the the issue of um, the issue of of ra of race class combinations and the and the no and um the maintain the maintaining of of that kind of um dark fantasy approach within the within the within the setting using that framework since um yeah there's been, there's been i mean to be honest there's very little mechanical stuff in this mm -hmm. but what we do have is 5e right mm -hmm. uh, but it is lost learn uh, but really you could play uh any fantasy game very very easily I mean, the main book is this player's gazetteer, and that doesn't have any rules because it's it's an actual artifact, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's the main book, and, and so yeah, there's no rules on that. And in the game master book, it's mostly in my style. It's not about the mechanics; it's about the world. But I think you could easily play it with any fantasy game that you wanted. You could easily play it with fate, with 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 you know, all, everything's very usable. Mm -hmm. Now, Badlander, which is our next Kickstarter coming out in December, because um, we're going to be doing all these Kickstarters really, really fast. I mean, our we already have actually Bloodstone at the printer, by the way. Like, our idea is very fast iteration. Like, we want to have um, the books being mailed out within, you know, a few months. And the PDF will be sent, will be mailed out the day the money clears from Kickstarter. Like, everything is done. So the our idea is everything I've been done. So any Badlander is our first role playing game, and while that is technically five E, we call it five E plus. And what that really means is that it's D twenty, but with a storyteller type system on it. It's it's a it's a very much of a role playing narrativist focused game system that uses D twenty. Mm -hmm. And the way I designed it is I kind of imagined you know if Sandy Peterson and Greg Stafford and Steve Perrin and Greg Kostikian and all my favorite uh, designers got together, you know, all the ones who don't do D&D, &D, and we were forced to take D&D &D and turn it into the best narrativist game ever. What would we do? Well, this is my version of that, you know? And I literally had their voices in me. And so I think people will be very surprised that that it basically, you know, you, you combine your ability to, dots plus your skill dots it's you know five dots in each right and mm -hmm. and and yeah, you you add that to your d20 roll and you try and beat a certain difficulty and that's the basic role of the game mm -hmm. and everything revolves around that and so i think people who are very uh and we we sort of we do have sort of character ranks but it's a social thing it's it, it's actually part of the world it's how guilds work Mm -hmm. It's how people s structure ranks. And so you have adept ranks 1 through 10. You have master ranks 1 through 10. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of our, our class system. And so we, we've rationalized. We've taken the D&D &D and turned it into something that I think is a beautiful modern game. But the great thing about it is you can tell your players who won't play anything but D&D &D or your friends who only love D&D, &D, you can say, hey, you know, it's D20. You know, it's 5E+. Plus. Just try it, you know. You you'll, you'll you'll recognize most of the rules, and so it becomes a very easy way to win people over. And I think if you watch any of these streaming games, mm -hmm. like like Mercer's game or all that, you can see they're not playing traditional D and D. Storytelling style in D and D is the trend. It's what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. The trouble is the game rules don't really support that. But our game rules are super simple, super slick super easy and you know you can just make a couple dice rolls skill rolls and you've resolved everything and yeah. and, and things are you know it's it's that it's the kind of game that most of us actually play right mm -hmm. we don't do hours of combat right Mo you know not unless it's a super important moment in the story oh uh, <laughs> what i i i um my partic my particular ta my particular table um has the has the fortune or misfortune to say, to say that we don't say that we don't have a set style we just uh, we just improvise with everything we get um especially since especially especially when i'm at the helm um they know yeah me. yeah and, and by the way i i love miniature gaming like 
So, you know, like the, in the classic D&D gaming is like a miniatures combat game, right? Um, but but when I'm role-playing, I, I tend to prefer you know, the kind of games I design, which is what you might expect, mm-hmm. you know, because game designers write the game they want to play. And I'm very much a narrativist, storytelling person. I want to... Yeah. I want people to role play. I want to tell epic, incredibly, insanely cool stories with vivid characters, insanely cool enemies, and just a world that doesn't stop. Yeah, and when it comes to when it comes that bring that brings me to a couple other um, a couple other things that are kind of quirks of the of the D and D setup um, that I'm I'm curious how they'd carry over into the into this sort of 5e plus that you have planned um one of them is the bi- is the big ass elephant in the room who's currently sitting on my couch that it that is magic um because i've got i've gotten in my fair share of arguments about the about the event va- about the Vancian model for years and when and when it comes and Especially when it comes. Okay, to... I'll, 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 yeah, I'll tell you right now. We we don't have any and Badlander. Mm-hmm. We don't have any magic spells at all. It's all <laughs> disciplines and edges that are like, uh, which are like um, your littler powers and disciplines, mm-hmm. which are like their major powers. Mm-hmm. So it's done kind of like vampire. So we just got rid of the whole Vancey and magic thing, which I don't like. Now, when Fang Knight comes mm-hmm. about our vampire game, yeah. our vampires are the spellcasters. And so then they have a magic system, which is kind of a cross between Ars Magica and Mage. Mm-hmm. And that will be an incredibly cool magic system. I mean, it's already been designed. Yeah. Um, so I, I can say it, it is really mm-hmm. cool. And um, and that's going to be something that's going to blow people's minds. Because mm-hmm. it'll be the first time, I think, that a lot of D&D players have seen like a modern totally rational working magic system that works within the dd d20 paradigm Mm -hmm. so uh i'm hoping that i'll just blow people's minds because yeah i I personally i hate the the dd magic system is i know it's traditional and everyone loves it but like i mean it's ridiculous and at the higher levels it completely breaks down and that's the really the main problem with dd if you analyze the statistics on dd beyond like no one hardly anyone i mean plays after level 10 because the system breaks down the spell system certainly does you get to those higher level spells there's no system or you you have to figure it out on your own it's going you're completely on your own and you know in terms of hit points and all that you're unkillable and it's just not any fun mm-hmm. and so that's why people don't play beyond level 10 right they just keep going back with i think with our games people will play all the way through 10 ranks of adept and all the way through 10 ranks of master and they'll go all the way up mm-hmm. and they can have a long fruitful career if they want to sorry to interrupt mm-hmm. and with with that with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind now when getting back getting back to um to bloodstone isle um one now i've i had when it comes to when it comes to the way, when it comes to the way it's structured, I know some, I know some, especially in the, especially in the wake of the adve- of the adventure path system from Pathfinder, um, some people organize their camp their campaign settings of their adventures, like a se- like a series of, um, for lack of a better term, episodes. But as as I understand it, um, Bloodstone Isle is, is arranged in a in a series of sec- of sections. Of of the particular aisle and and building off of that is is that is that accurate or is or is there is there going to be some narrative narrative arc throughout the adventure? I mean, it is a sandbox, mm-hmm. but there is also a narrative arc, which players can either pick up on intermittently or they can follow it like a bloodhound. So, but either way, as they go through the the sandbox the narrative arc will appear again and again and again mm-hmm. and they'll be sucked in so for, so for me that's how you do it you 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 let give players a freedom but you know reality intrudes you know and there's things going on 
And those things that go, are going on will intrude on your life, whether you want them to or not sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you can, you can change that. Like I think the best sandbox thing is not just that you can go in and uh, you know play in the sandbox, but but you can change the sandbox, right? You can actually change things, mm -hmm. and that's the key to the sandbox play: is to feel like, hey, I'm an actor in this ongoing drama, and what we do will change what other people do, and will change the course of things. So we have some very clever ways in which we allow players to do that, and for the game master to keep track. And I, I think uh, people will feel this huge sense of empowerment from be, having the freedom to do whatever they want and yet still feel like they're directly involved in this amazing story of, you know, these three former pirates turned into almost gods having their their war, you know? And uh, the Shadow Vane vampires are the faction that are run by one of them who are, you know, who are feeding off everyone else on the island and everyone else on the island are looking for someone to save them from these, these horrible, horrible, dark sabbat like vampires. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the big theme is, is, is how do, how do you get rid of these shadow vein or how do you stop them from, you know, and then it turns out as Quill, the, the scribe who wrote the, the Gazette, the Gazetteer, I mean, he's a hostage. He's held in a prison camp on top of the volcano in the middle of the island, mm -hmm. uh, the Shadow Vein camp. And so rescuing him and the other hostages is a, is a big part of the motivation of what people end up wanting to do. Yeah. And um when it comes to, when it comes to the when it comes to the factions and the and the um Shadow Vein, is it a is it a case where um and it, this might lean a bit spoilery, but is it an instance where the where um where, where one of the three factions is is t is more tied to the shadow vein than others and that's up to the gm sort sort of like the who is the black cowl thing in the um re in the remake yeah with although in one of my although in one of my play tests the players are like screw it we're joining the shadow vein and they did mm -hmm. so you know they're they're meant to be the big enemy but you can totally just join them and they had a great time playing the bad guys and, and you know, it was fun. I, I, you know, I I enjoy that once in a while. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good, you know. And then one of the players actually had a, uh, you know, a a thing, a, a moment of conscience, you know, and left. And they actually killed their own companion. And that player just made a new character. It was hilarious. It was mm -hmm. really good. It was high drama. Everyone loved it. But those are advanced players. I wouldn't recommend that for everyone. Yeah. You know. Now, as I now. As I understand it, um, Bloodstone Isle is going to be split into three books: the um, Player's Gazetteer, which we've talked about, um, the Game Master's Cyclopedia, which is going to be all the material for the G for the GM um, in this, and the Bloodstone Covenant, which is a lot of the a lot of the stuff that they that you guys just didn't have didn't have room for in the other in the other um, book. Um, now, there's a few, there are a few things that I'm that I'm curious of, that I'm curious about since, obviously, with the Game Master Cyclopedia, um, I don't want to get into spoiler territory on this kind of thing, but one of the things that I saw in the Bloodstone Covenant that I'm curious to pick your brain about is the concept yep. of fail forward and the skill check ladder. Fail forward is something I've been see I've I've seen I've seen in discussions for the for the last decade. And I would be I would be curious um, your re your reasoning for int for introducing that here. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, we're just trying to uh, you know pre discuss some of the the uh, some of the um, ideas in our our game system, which is called Tail Spinner, by the way, mm -hmm. um, which is the five E plus. But it's a, it's really more of a storyteller type system. It, it sort of, you know, explain some of our, our philosophy. And fail forward is definitely one of the things that uh, a lot of people, I think, like you and me, are familiar with. But many, many, many people are still not familiar with. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea that, you know, as a game master, you're not, it's you're not there to, to, to fight the players, you know. <laughs> Which, which, to my, you know, I mean, 
just from what I learned lurking online and watching people play at conventions is that that's still how a lot of people play D and D. The DM is there to kill the players. The players are there to survive, right? Mm-hmm. People people still play that way. And the fail forward, I think, it makes it very very clear that's not how you play. That that how you play is that you're there to certainly test the players and challenge them and and and, and sort of put them in a box and you know and, and and sort of you know ask them to find their way out of it. But 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 you don't want to basically get stuck. And fail forward just means that um, if you fail like a detective role, you still get the information because the story has to continue, right? But now you're screwed for some reason, Mm -hmm. right? Like you made a big noise while trying to pick the safe and now the guards are running. You still open the damn safe because we have to open the safe for the sake of the story, right? So the story, so you get the information, the story can continue. But you screwed that roll up, and that's going to come with a horrible price. Mm-hmm. And that that's just the idea behind it, that the story is the, the centerpiece, and you want that story to be good. Mm-hmm. And so failing forward is, is that idea, that that even if you fail the role, you still succeed in the task. So if that task is key to the story, although if it's not key to the story, then no, you fail. Mm-hmm. If that task is key to the story, you succeed. But something horrible happens, which is going to really screw you. And as a game master, your your goal is to make that hurt. Mm-hmm. Now the now subsequently, um, I'm curious about the skill check ladder. Is the, the last time I saw a check ladder was um was when I got first introduced to Fate, and obviously, since you're using a D20 system, the two of them are. <laughs> that's not going to be the most apropos comparison. Yeah. Um, yeah. The idea behind that is um, is that these thresholds. You're talking about the thresholds, the five, ten, mm-hmm. fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty. Yeah. The idea behind that is that these are very, very easy numbers to remember, and that by using the system, you don't have to declare ahead of time what the difficulty is, and and, and that takes up time. And what my philosophy of of gaming is, especially when I'm redoing D&D, and D&D's biggest problem is it's slow. It's just so slow. I'm, and, and people, you know, that's why you have that meme of people of, of, and D&D of leaving the table, right? Like people literally during combat will leave the table all the time and it's not their turn. Because it could be like an hour before their turn comes around again, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not that common, but it does happen a lot. Um and so there's that whole meme of leaving the table. Don't leave the table, you know, but everyone does. And so anyway, uh, our combat is way, way fast. And that's not an issue. Um, and part of the reason is that, but also when we have ability checks, you don't have to stop and go, okay, what's the difficulty? No, just roll the dice and tell me what you get. And then if it, but everyone knows it has to be a certain threshold. So if you get over 10, you have a mild, successfully not that good. But something important, everyone knows it's not going to work. Right, you don't need the game master to tell you. They'll go, "Oh, I got eleven. Yeah, I know." Mm-hmm. And the game master goes, "Okay, you, you kind of you read the book and you really don't understand it well, but you do get one idea out of it. You know, there's a curse. Mm-hmm. But if you roll over fifteen, you know what the curse is. If you roll over twenty, you know maybe how to uh, an idea of how to beat the curse. If you roll over twenty-five, you know you know basically an exact way to beat the curse. And over thirty, you know you've already figured out how to undo the curse." Mm-hmm. you know that kind of thing and so the thresholds just make gaming with d20 way simple oh yeah way simple and 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 it just speeds up everything because once everyone gets used to it boom players themselves will tell you oh yeah i i just got a 17 i know it's not good enough but do i learn anything mm-hmm. And then the whole fail forward thing kicks in, and the game master will give you some hint at least, you know, but not not the not the meat. Mm-hmm. Of course, and- at lower levels, a, a fifteen is not bad, mm-hmm. right? You know, whereas you get the high, you get your character gets better and better when your character's a higher rank. Then of course, you know, you need a twenty five to get anything. But then that makes sense. You're you're probably doing much harder tasks, you know, at the higher levels. Oh yeah. Now. One of now, um, 
one of the other things that one of the other optional rules that I did that I was that I was curious about since I've seen this tackled in in multiple forms and I'm probably going to I'm probably going to see other people tackle it in their in their own in their own form down the road just be, just because this is an itch that people want scratched is mass combat and how and how you're handling it. Um yeah, in Badlander we have a whole system for that. And basically, um, we have a thing called, uh, um, for instance, when you do multiple attacks, mm -hmm. um, this is an optional rule, but we have called the one roll to rule them all. You do one roll per turn, uh, unless you want to do a combat where, you know, it's really intense. So if you have multiple attacks, you roll once, and then you just pick up as many, let's say you're a fighter and you have like four attacks a turn. Well, you pick up that many, you roll once, but then you pick up that many damage dice and you roll them all, right, at once. And then you can assign them to targets. So so it's just really fun to have a bunch of damage dice. And so that's basically how uh, mass combat can work, is that you, you have, um, you can do it that way, or you can just sort of do um, what we call, um, do it as a team challenge, which is kind of like a, remember in, fourth edition dv there was the skill challenge mm -hmm. where you kind of you got to get four five in our case you get four or five or six uh skill uh, successes before you get three failures mm -hmm. right and so your players are all trying to make these roles together to work it together and so you uh, you would just you, our mass combat system kind of works like that that you got to get you got to collect six successes without getting a, more than three failures to, to succeed in this mass combat. Mm -hmm. And so we do it more in a flexible way. Or you can do it out as a normal combat, but you're you're instead of making your um your roles as let's say um you know you're making a dexterity plus one-handed weapon role, you'd make your charisma plus leadership role because you're because you're leading the troops and then with that you're making your role. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have a zone system for movement, which is uh, so you don't you don't have to do the which I think is a very elegant, beautiful system that people are crazy about, and that is um, going to be something that you can use at any scale. Mm -hmm. So you could do you could use that zone system to do a whole like multi year campaign over many kingdoms, or you can do it on the you know a brawl inside of a tavern. It's, it's mm -hmm. it can be scaled up or down as you wish. Which is, is interesting that you bring up the whole brawl, brawl in a tavern thing, given given that was dedicated to its own set of mechanics in um, um, Brand Colonia when I had the, when I had those guys on. Yeah. Um, okay. And and tr and le and let's be let's be fair. Since we're dealing since we're dealing with since we're dealing with pirates, some some drunken brawling is inevitable. Yes, yes, and Bloodstone that definitely is a big part of it. Uh, that's one thing, by the way, in Lost Learn, I'm really, really happy with is that um, there is a tradition that um, you, when you basically fight someone, you don't want to kill them because you want to ransom them, and this is actually how it was historically, right? You don't kill your enemy; you want to keep them alive so you can get make money from them. Dad, they're worthless. And so uh, in Lost Lorne, it's part of your honor that you don't want to kill an opponent. You hold them ransom, and, and they actually have to pledge their, their, um, t to you that they won't make trouble and they won't try and escape. And then they're allowed to walk around your camp freely and walk around your castle, and they're pledged by their honor not to try to escape until their ransom is paid. Mm -hmm. And people actually did that, and they do do that in, in Lost Lorne. Yeah. And we actually have in Badlander and all the Tailspinner games we have a thing called quex die and so when you roll a 20 uh you get plus one in your crux die which is a giant size d6 at the table mm -hmm. if you roll a one the other side gets a crux point and if anyone's dice gets over six then the other side has to make a charisma or or morale roll or they'll run away or mm -hmm. surrender so there's a way to win combat and lost learn and the pale spinner system without actually lifting your weapon. And that's happened in playtesting where the players refuse to do any attacking, right? They're actually sitting in a, a little tower and they just used all these charisma and, and negotiation roles and out Fox the other side, broke the morale and they surrendered. Mm -hmm. It was, it was incredible. 
Um, so there's other ways to get, uh, obviously, um, crux points, mm -hmm. uh, crux dice points, besides 20 and rolling one. That's just the basic level of it. Um, but that basically shows there's a way in which you can sort of um, wage war without actually lifting a weapon. And that, that helps a huge amount with the disciplines that we're writing for all the players, like spinsters, who are the, the storyteller wizard type guys, um, and the and the the avowed who are kind of like the monk, you know, style um, priests, clerics, and and all that. So it, it's a it's a pretty cool. Uh, I, I'm really I think people are gonna love the crux die, and that's gonna be used a lot in other people's. Uh, even people don't play our games, they'll use it in their campaigns because it, it just it just makes combat so much more interesting and multifaceted. Oh yeah, now. One of the one of the um, fighter subclasses that's that's that is brought up on the Kickstarter page that I did want to ask about um, is the Iron Knight. What's 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 the what's what's his particular motif and what and what's he bringing to the um, fighter's particular sandbox? Yeah, uh, on the on on Bloodstone Island, the, the Iron Knights are basically this. Um... They're kind of like uh, they're, they're kind of like Knights Templar mixed with Inquisitors, mixed with almost like a slave society. Basically, when you are uh, the Knight Templars will buy slaves from you know they don't call them slaves. That's essentially what they are. They have to work as their thrall. But if you work well and are loyal, you'll rise in the ranks, and eventually they'll give you a suit of armor. They'll teach you how to fight. And they'll teach you how to ride horses, and you become a full fledged member of the order. <laughs> So all the members come up through the ranks, and then there's this hardcore knights militant, and uh, and they're on Bloodstone to try and you know um, fight the Shadow Vein and 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 spread the their the word of their church, which is the Sacra Prisma Church, and uh, and they're pretty hardcore, and uh, they're actually the Iron Knights will eventually be I think our seventh game in this series. Mm -hmm. We're doing ten games in a row. Of different points of view, and they're just going to be our hardcore inquisitor, you know, types, which uh, which I think is definitely some people want to play them. Uh, but for this game, we actually gave a whole D and D fighter class for D and D players, which I think will bring a whole new way to play fighters that people will enjoy. That is, uh, you know, that hasn't quite been done before. I mean, we have seen inquisitors and all that. Um, but not as a necessarily as a fighter class, and mm -hmm. and so in this book we actually give it as a fighter class. Yeah, I think it's a subclass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, give, given given what you mentioned, I'm pretty sure it's inevitable before someone makes a joke about no one expecting the Iron Inquisition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, meme magic is real. Is all I'm is all I'm saying. Uh, yes, but with with that in mind, now first off, I do want to offer my congratulations for uh, man for managing to get o managing to get over the hump with uh, with it currently at the time of this recording at um twenty three point three thousand um at, as and that and that is three thousand over your over your initial goal. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, once the Kickstarter is over mm -hmm. and as soon as the money clears, everyone will immediately get their PDFs, like immediately it's, they're done. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, I think it's pretty cool. How many Kickstarters can say that you get your, your, you know, as, as soon as your check clears, you get your prize immediately. Mm -hmm. And then the actual books are already at the printer. The printer's already begun. So the books should be shipped hopefully in December. Right. And people will receive them before Christmas. Hopefully. I can't guarantee that, but that's our schedule, you know? Uh, this is a hard and difficult time to do things, mm -hmm. but we're printing in uh, North America, and we're using military post to ship to Europe. So if you're in the USA, Canada, or Europe, you should definitely be getting your books by... Uh, um, by uh, by December, unless something goes wrong with the printer. Well, just to make sure, you know, I, I, can, I can't guarantee that, that. I can't guarantee that, but that is the plan. And oh. by the way, if you're in Europe, 
Uh, don't worry about shipping. We're, once again, we have military post. Um, so we can sense the, 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 print, the shipping will be done from Germany. So it won't be like it to pay for shipping from America. So it would be much cheaper than most Kickstarters. Yeah. And just to make sure I don't tempt the gods of irony. Um, uh, but, <laughs> look, look, you know how, you know how it is. There are, there are no atheists in foxholes and there are, and there are even fewer at the gaming table. Um, especially, especially when it comes to the dice gods. Yeah. But, um, with all, but with all of that, with all of that said, um, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, which I get, I get the feeling, I get the feeling will ha will happen in one form or another. Um, yeah, let's do that for Badlander when it comes out the, early next year. Yeah, the door is always open, as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, uh, thanks for having me on, and uh, I'll uh, look forward to talking to you uh, soon. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>